Well, as Paul continues to express to us these kind of uh, word pictures of being soldiers, of being uh, athletes, of being farmers, he uh, concludes by saying to Timothy the following in verse 7, he says, Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Uh, it's interesting because I, I have people a lot of times that think that insight is something that you read in a book or just happens to come to you. I can't tell you how many times I've been teaching on a topic and I've been going through a lot of the background, the history, and, and all these different things that go into explaining a text. And somebody will come with me and they say, can you refer to me a book that I can read that has all of this information in it? <laughs> and I just, I start chuckling because I think, here I've been at this for 50 years and I've read hundreds and hundreds of books, <laughs> spent a lot of hours studying. And here's someone who's basically saying, can you teach me how to do brain surgery and three easy steps. I've got 10 minutes. You know, it's like it doesn't work that way. It comes as a consequence of hard work. And anything you want to be good at, you have to spend a lot of time investing in learning about it and practicing it and becoming better at it. I can tell you that when I first started teaching the Bible, uh, there was nothing to write home about. <laughs> I mean, really, I had a very elementary understanding even of the text. And it takes many years really to become informed in what the text is. And even today, I never stop researching and going back and double checking things that I learned because the Bible is a big book and there's a lot of information in that. And at the same time, we are in an age where we are constantly learning new things. The archaeological discoveries and other things are helping us. New texts and so forth are always opening up new dimensions and understanding and a deeper grasp of what the Bible says and what it was meant to speak to us and how it can relate to us today and so forth and so on. So when he says reflect upon it, it means that you think upon it. Literally, the term that he uses here in the original means to, to ponder on it, to perceive, to consider with the mind, um, as opposed to some simply just going with your feelings. It's kind of the idea of some fairly intense mental reflection. Now, when I first became a Christian, I had come out of Eastern mysticism where we did a lot of meditation. And I remember talking with a, another Christian who wasn't really much more mature than I was, but I asked him, is it wrong for me to meditate like I had done in Eastern medicine? meditation? He said, well, I don't think so because the Bible talks about meditating on the Lord. And I remember I thought about that for a moment and I realized that when I was doing Eastern meditation, it was a very different practice and discipline than when I was a Christian and meditating on the Lord, or more importantly, even meditating on the Lord through His Word. You see, in Eastern med meditation, what you're trying to do is disengage the mind. What I was doing is really kind of turning the mind off and just letting my feelings, my senses, experience what was going on around me in the spiritual realm. I found out later on that it's basically a means of slowly allowing you to become controlled by demonic personalities and leads ultimately to demon possession, where you find that many Eastern gurus have a lot of power, but it's not their power, it's demonic power that is operating through them. But essentially, that's what the meditation led to. It's the divesting myself of any intellectual thought and allowing whatever I feel to be the thing that controls and governs my life. Today, I see the very same thing happening through the use of media or through the use of technology. I see a whole generation of young people who are spending hours not thinking cognitively, but rather sitting down and following the programming of a game. And they feel like they're, you know, I'm learning things. I'm learning to have, how to have certain skills. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're turning off the whole critical thinking dynamic of your brain. So you have people who know how to run these amazing programs. Some of these games are so far beyond me, I can't understand them. But the simple fact is, when you turn around and look at them and see how they're dealing with the basic practical problems of life, they haven't got a clue. Because they've never really had to sit down and reflect on the purpose and the meaning of life and how to live well. They just find themselves constantly distracted by other things. And so what you end up having is a, a generation of people who may have some skills in some very narrow and limited areas, but they really don't know how to navigate life as a whole. And there's many of us who came to Christ because we were trying to navigate life based upon our feelings and found it always ended up someplace where we didn't want to be. 
And so we're not trying to empty our minds when we're looking at Scripture or meditating upon the Lord. We're trying to make sense of what the Word of God says and to understand how it applies to my life on an everyday way. And that's why I remember what my pastor said one time. It was really helpful. He said, when we're reading the Bible, he says, if the plain sense makes good sense, don't seek any other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. I mean, I heard a lot of people who came up with a lot of nonsensical applications to the Bible. You know, coming out of the hippie uh, era, um, there were a lot of people who were smoking grass. I remember it talked about how that Jesus had the people when he fed the 5,000. In John 6, it talks about he had them sit down and uh, in groups of 50. And it says, because there was much grass there. Or how in Genesis, there was uh, that he blessed, uh, he gave the herbs of the field for food. And, you know, we took that and said, See, God wants us to smoke pot. It's what he asked us to do. Well, the whole point is that that would be like saying, because it's organic, I should eat it. And there are a lot of things that are organic and are deadly poisonous, and they will kill you very quickly. And I wouldn't advise you eat them, nor does anybody else. But most people don't realize that most drugs actually are various levels of poison. That even anesthesia, when you go to the hospital and the doctor puts you under so you don't feel the pain of the knife, the point is that the anesthesiologist is trained to essentially, and I use this word advisedly, poison you so that you go into a form of coma so that you won't feel the pain, and not, but not to do it so deep that you don't come back. And as a result, he uses other chemicals or medications to bring you back. We call them medications, basically they're chemicals, to bring you back from that coma state and help you to become alert and then begin to function once again. But that's something that people oftentimes don't realize is that you have been, you know, basically partly poisoned in order to be able to endure the pain of surgery. And it's not something that you would advise because guys like Michael Jackson got a hold of propanol, which is a very useful drug if you have to have cert certain kind of uh, medical treatments. I've had it and but I've been thankful for it. But the simple fact is you keep on taking it and you end up like him. You end up killing yourself. And so you have to understand that these things that, that we oftentimes look to as things to be the answer oftentimes become a temporary solution that leads to ultimately a very negative consequence. So it is when we fill our minds with the things of God's Word and the things that fills of the Spirit, we find ourselves gaining insight into life on how to navigate it, not how to avoid it. So why did I get involved in this mysticism? Because I didn't know how to deal with life. I had done alcohol, I had done drugs, I tried sex, drugs, and rock and roll. None of those things made me any happier. Somebody told me, you learn to do this kind of discipline and meditation and you'll be a happy person. So I did it and I found eventually that it didn't make me a happy person. It just made me get a deeper and deeper look at how unfit I was as a person and how damaged I was emotionally, psychologically, and otherwise. And so as a consequence, I find myself in a very desperate place. When I heard the gospel story, I was afraid to accept Christ because I had tried so many other things that hadn't worked. Quite honestly, I remember having this conversation with God saying, God, if I try this and this doesn't work out, if this Jesus thing doesn't work, then I'm in deep weeds. I mean, I don't know that I'll be able to resist the urge just to take my own life. And it was so amazing to me, but I was kind of like at the end of my road, I had no other options. And I'll never forget, when I asked Jesus into my heart, it was so real and so true and so powerful that I knew that there was no turning back, that there was nothing else out there that I hadn't tried, and therefore I was gonna go all in to follow Jesus. And I think that's part of what Paul's taking, talking about when he says, reflect on these things. I want you to, he said, to understand these things so that you approach your Christian life as being somebody who's all in, not just somebody who's dipping your toes in the water to see whether it's cold or lukewarm or whatever it is, but you're doing it to see, is it something, you're doing it in a way of saying, I'm going to take the plunge and I'm going to go all in because I'm committed all the way until the end. I think that's what the reflection leads to. Ultimately, what happens when you become a Christian is you develop your mental capacity for reasoning through reasoning through the scriptures. So when he says to Isaiah, come, let us reason together, though your sins are as red as scarlet, they will become white as snow. God isn't calling for people to turn their brain off and just follow somebody's uh, droning voice, kind of like they did at Koresh, you know, uh, David Koresh did at his place. 
What he's calling us to do is to really draw near to God and to seek to think his thoughts after him and to know him and to understand his ways and to bring that insight into practical application into my daily life. Hope that makes sense. I feel like I kind of meandered there. Anyway, we'll continue tomorrow as we look at the next verse in line, verse 8. God bless you. Go in his grace.